Uh, this is a, uh, going to be a uh, communications forum which is brought uh, to us by Comparative Media Studies and the Center for Future Civic Media. Um, my name is Christian Semihai. I direct the Center for Future Civic Media, um, which has been going for a little under three years now, um, and we're uh, dedicated to developing technologies uh, for kind of democratic processes in geographic communities, um, uh, really with an emphasis on kind of new media and new forms of social action enabled by digital platforms. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we really see ourselves as having feet in a bunch of different areas. Um, we come out of a long tradition in comparative media studies in the MIT Media Lab of thinking through uh, technologies for uh, journalism uh, and uh, kind of reportage. And uh, my own research group specialized in uh, data transparency uh, and uh, to some degree whistleblowing as well. Um, and uh, so you put that together and you have a fairly good uh, excuse for why we invited um, these two very skilled and talented people. Um, so uh, what, I'll, what I'll do is um, I'm just going to introduce them uh, each uh, one by one, um, reading uh, off of bios that you could probably get online. Um, uh, well, actually, only one of them. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but then uh, they're going to start by uh, giving short lectures uh, of about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, no more. Um, I'll ask some questions at the end of that. And then we have a full hour uh, for you guys to ask questions. So um, what I'd encourage you to do is uh, take careful notes, because uh, uh, right now uh, it's more of a Frisbee day than a lecture day in the afternoon, as one of our speakers pointed out, and in fact um, was, was asking if we could just cancel. Um, but I said, no, no, uh, no Frisbee for you. Um, so uh, so, so there, there aren't that many people in the audience here. Um, so it would be great if you uh, were ready to ask um, you know, in-depth questions. I'm pretty sure that you'll have time to get follow-ups um, afterwards. Um, so uh, we'll start with Linda Fanton, immediately to my left. Um, Linda is, uh, uh, has a background in journalism, started out as a journalist in small towns of Wyoming, um, piecing together newspapers with uh, hot wax and border tape. And bailing wire? And bailing wire? No, no, bailing wire. Um, uh, and and uh, uh, not just hot wax, but also a partnership, a close partnership with the readers. Um, these rural news organizations are incredibly tight with their readers. Um, and technology has changed a lot in the 18 years since she got started in journalism, but her devotion to journalism uh, and a deep connection with communities has not. Um, in January 2008, she joined Minnesota Public Radio, American Public Media. Um, which most of you know, um, uh, and, and a, a project called Public Insight Journalism, um, an initiative that's become a model for making news more relevant and collaborative um, and for reconnecting newsrooms with the communities that they serve. Um, at the heart of it is a network of 83,000, uh, as of now, but it keeps growing, 83,000 public sources who share their insights and expertise to broaden and strengthen news coverage. Um, insight analysts use online games, simulations, and collaborative tools uh, to help newsrooms around the country identify emerging stories, um, define major news projects, and engage citizens. Um, after editing weekly papers in Wyoming, Fandon spent a dozen years as a reporter and editor for the Salt Lake Tribune, where her investigative and storytelling skills were uh, uh, frequently honored. Um, she worked briefly for Newsweek uh, before moving to Minnesota and continues to write a monthly column for uh, the Salt Lake Tribune. She's taught and lectured on journalism at the University of Wyoming, where she earned a BA in journalism in 1992. So thank you so much um, for joining us. Um, and next we have Ellen Miller, um, who's the co-founder and executive director of the Sunlight Foundation, a Washington-based nonpartisan, nonprofit um, uh, organization dedicated uh, to using the power of internet to catalyze greater government openness and transparency. Um, and really the preeminent organization doing this uh, in the United States. Um, she's the founder of two other prominent Washington-based organizations in the field of money and politics, um, the Center for Responsive Politics and Public Campaign. And I have to say that I uh, first engaged with CRP when one of my students was doing a big government pan transparency project and found that the CRP database was absolutely the best database on politics and money. Um, and he was basically building a system that merged it with a bunch of other databases by a bunch of other organizations. Um, and then we got a cease and desist letter. But on following up, um, uh, we, we, they were very generous. Um, uh, they, they had real concerns and we addressed them. And uh, um, so a ph phenomenal organization. Um, but she keeps producing them one every five years, uh, six years or so, it's just incredible. Um, uh, and she's a nationally recognized expert on transparency and the influence of money in politics. 
um, uh, is her experience, and that's recognized as an expert on commenting on it, not um, participating in it. Um, her experience as a Washington advocate for more than 35 years spans the worlds of nonprofit ac advocacy, grassroots activism, and journalism. Um, Ms. Miller's work was recently featured in Washington Magazine, Fast Company, who called her one of the most influential women in technology, Wired, who said that she's one of 15 people the president should listen to, um, uh, and uh, the Chronicle of Philanthropy, and many more. Um, she's also served as dep dep uh, Deputy Director of Campaign for America's Future, uh, the publisher of TomPain.com, and a senior fellow at American Prospect. Uh, she spent nearly a decade working on Capitol Hill to great effect, um, and she blogs regularly at SunlightFoundation.com. So um, uh, without further ado, we're gonna have Linda open um, and give a presentation about public insight journalism. So thank you. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the death now. I get to use this, right? Yeah. And I guess it's very real. Well, thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. As Chris said, I started my journalism career in a bunch of small weeklies in Wyoming, and I always said that uh, people read the paper to find out if we knew what they knew. Um, <laughs> which was absolutely true. Um, so I joined uh, NPR, American Public Media, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, the Public Insight Network, Public Insight Journalism, was in full swing. It was founded about six or seven years ago um, by some really smart people, Bill Kling, Michael Scholar, Bill Busenberg, and uh, a couple of other uh, folks who are still on our staff. Um, and. Technology has changed a lot since then. I mean, seven years in, in today's world is, is like centuries with the changes that we're, we're seeing both in media and technology. Um, but the, you know, the base, there's this basic premise behind PIJ. Many of you, if you've heard of it, it's a big database of sources, but it's really grown into something much, much more. It's, uh, it, it's actually a, a, almost a community of practitioners, if you will. I mean, we're now uh, embedded in so many newsrooms that we sort of see this as, as a, a great model for networked journalism and community engagement. And, um, and so I just, going to take a little time to walk you through a little bit of the particulars, but maybe the focus on how it's kind of reshaping news gathering in, new in newsrooms around the country. Um, whoops. So the so the principles behind PIJ are pretty simple, that uh, people out there in the community have a lot of different expertise, basically through their experiences, or maybe they have authoritative expertise, and they really want to share it with us. Um, they, and if we can tap into this, if we can collect it, if we can tag it, categorize it, and infuse it into our journalism on a daily basis, we can make that coverage um, richer and deeper and, uh, more importantly, more relevant. So what's an example of someone who might be in the network? Well, you know, an airline mechanic with 20 years experience of working on Boeing 737s is going to have a certain amount of uh, knowledge about the airworthiness of that plane, maybe even more so than an FAA instructor who's examining data and reports because they've actually generated the reports. So those are the kind of people who are in our, in, in our network as well as FAA instructors, actually. Um, Elizabeth Warren knows a lot about bankruptcy, but someone who's been through bankruptcy has different kinds of insights, insights they could share on, on those issues. And so when people hear their voices and their stories reflected in news coverage, um, they connect with it. It becomes more relevant. And relevancy builds it's trust, and trust is something that's sorely lacking in, in the media today. But again, PIJ, I think, um, is, is more than that. It's actually grown into the system of engagement, if you will. And the idea is that as people share their firsthand insights and, and such, and uh, they can become more informed about their communities and become more engaged and therefore more able to solve problems. And in the case of what we're talking about here today, um, that builds a much more robust democracy. And this is a principle that's um, fundamental to public media, which is why it's not surprising that this whole system sort of took, took root at a public radio station. Um, so how do we build this network? Well, we do it through a variety of means. Um, we, we do it through our websites. So every partner that has PIJ embedded in its newsroom will have a website. 
We will create uh, web survey forms for the people in the network, and we'll post those links on the websites. We'll do call-outs on the radio and steer people to it. You see um, news orgs all the time doing this on Facebook now and Twitter. They tweet out a question, hey, um, NPR, National Public Radio, is looking for people age 30 to 45 who just got kicked out of their homes or are under foreclosure. We just happen to have a system that captures it all in a database, and therefore it's searchable, and it kind of changes the way you're, you can approach journalism. We also uh, reach out through, um, you know, oh, let's see, it looks like these things are kind of all on a click here, sorry. Um, they used to be automated. Uh, again, social networking, social media, we use that as well. And we also have developed a number of serious games that uh, both work in this area of government transparency and providing data and information to people. But at the end of each of these games, people have the option of joining the public insight network, providing some demographic information, and then comparing their results. I'll talk a little bit more about budget here in a minute. We also meet people face to face. I mean, digital tools are great, but when you really want to have engagement with the audience and the public, sometimes you have to meet them where they are. Not everyone has access to the internet or a computer to fill out a web survey, so it's really important that we do a lot of face to face work. So, but the important thing is kind of what we do with people's insights. This is what counts, this is why people sign up. Um, when you have a database that's searchable by zip code, by uh, passion, interest, expertise, occupation, um, you can quickly reach out to people and get insight. Uh, if you're familiar with the story of the uh, airplane, the Northwest airplane that overshot the Minneapolis airport several months ago and it kind of became a big national story, we were able to turn to our database really quickly, not only identify pilots, but pilots who fly the highly automated A320 plane. And in this case, we found someone who had nine years experience flying the plane, who had, was now an FAA uh, consultant and had written his master's thesis on the consequences of boredom in the cockpit. It was incredible. Uh, we got him to write a commentary for the website, so while, uh, most news organizations were sort of talking about, um, you know, what happened in this instance and how dare you, you know, how dare you let people get on their laptops and have conversations. We actually had some, some real insight into why that's actually a good thing. Um, we also are able to uh, let people's voices sort of be heard on their own terms. So in this case, we uh, wanted to find out how, uh, on the 50th anniversary of Sputnik, how that event had changed people's lives. We focused on the scientific community. We got a survey out. We distributed it. We contacted people who have connections to scientists. And we were able to gather a ton of really rich stories that both aired on the radio, became a slideshow. And now we have 250 physicists in the network. As a journalist, you might think, wow, I need to talk to a physicist. But think how it changes the way you do your job when you go, I have 250 physicists. What would I like to know from them? It's a much different process. Um, when you when you have, journalism is often done with this catch and release method. Reporters interview people, they're done with them. They may contact them another time, but it's only when they need something from them. Um, because we regularly reach out to people, we make it a point to try to contact people in some fashion once a month in the network. We're sort of maintaining a connection and relationship to them over time. And this results in a level of trust so that they will tell us things and talk to us and go on the radio with stories that might be otherwise hard to get. In the case of Oregon Public uh, Broadcasting, they're able to tell stories about, uh, or talk to people that the media often just talks about. So they've done series on stories of women who've had abortions, they've talked to people in bankruptcy, they've talked to people who've been in the penal system, and this is all made possible by this continuous relationship that we build with the public. Um, one of the uh, sort of, I think, really, maybe not surprising, but most rewarding parts about public insight journalism is that it often reveals stories that you didn't know you were looking for. So in this case, KUOW in Seattle, the reporter wanted to do a story about uh, condominiums, uh, people who were renting, and they got kicked out of their apartment buildings because they were going to go condo. And because we were open enough about the questions we were asking, what we got was someone who was, uh, used to live in a mobile home park. And two years earlier, the entire community was uprooted for a development that never took place because of the economy. So this reporter it wasn't where they were looking, but it was a much better story in their, in their opinion. Um, 
Oftentimes, PIJ can help us get ahead of the story. In this case, we had been talking to military contractors and soldiers about the tensions and experiences that they have, uh, mostly testing a hunch. And so we'd been gathering information and stories from people. So when the Blackwater scandal broke, we had a really rich contextual story to tell about these people, whereas most media organizations were still sort of focused on just the scandal, and we were able to add a lot of context to that, mainly because we were, had our ears to the ground. And let's see. PIJ also has the element to really um, make government more transparent and accountable, but maybe not in a way that you've traditionally thought about. New Hampshire Public Radio decided that they would use the Public Insight Network and those tools as a way to reach out to their, uh, they have something called town meeting in, in New Hampshire. I don't know if they have it here in Massachusetts too. But they reached out to all these town administrators and they said, um, you know, we'd like to have some information about what's, what are your budget priorities, what's on your budget agenda. And they got incredible response because they, people saw this as a public service. They'd put it on a website and there would be towns and people could click on it and see when the budget hearing was and what the major issues were. But what it gave the station was an incredible amount of information and they were able to spot a trend in um, how that basically uh, the, I think it was, uh, oh, the, the, the towns were actually discouraging reliance on property tax, and they could not have seen that had they not had this tremendous response and be able to see all that data in one place. Um, in, in, in this instance, we had, uh, uh, we'd been talking to a lot of people about the economy. People had been telling us that they, there weren't a lot of jobs out there with benefits. So when the state issued its regular job vacancy report, we said, well, hey, what we'd like to see is uh, how many of these jobs have benefits and how's that changed over time? Do you track that? And they said, well, yeah, we do, but we've never actually parsed the data that way. Let us get back to you. And when they did, they were really astonished to find that there had been like an 80% turnaround in several industries, or 180 de uh, degree turnaround, where 80% of the jobs used to be benefited, and now only 20% of those jobs were benefited. So sometimes just talking to people and listening to them can teach you what questions to ask. And in this case, um, push government to think about the data they're collecting in a different way. I mentioned before that I think uh, that public insight journalism is an incredible catalyst for collaboration. We've worked some with ProPublica. We, uh, we, we did a big healthcare project with them where we queried our network and their network about what people's most pressing, pressing healthcare needs are. They then took that information and they looked at the bills before Congress and they wrote stories about how those bills would or would not meet the, the health care needs as stated by ordinary citizens around the country. We've also got an ongoing project with him right now around unemployment and unemployment insurance that's, that's really interesting and gathering some, some good stories. I should say that the Public Insight Network, because it's self-selecting and it's not representative of the country, is not a polling tool. It, we don't do surveys. We don't say 45% of women aged 30 to 45 care about X. It's really a way to just kind of tap into what is important to people and what they're concerned about and what their experiences are and find their expertise and sort of bring that um, into, our, into our work. Um, and so if you think about other ways that you can sort of use these tools. In this case, uh, talk about government accountability, it's a different way. It's not that we started with a lot of data, it's that a, a reporter wanted to do a story about healthcare in the prisons, and after we started talking to people, we found that the real story was about all these abuses that had happened and taken place after um, a big riot in the Chino prison in Southern California. Um, because people aren't accessing the web and filling out surveys in prison, we actually found people who had relatives who were in prison and they took written printouts of our survey into the prison and had the prisoners fill them out and then we brought them back and entered them in by, by hand. Um, and this resulted in an incredible investigative report and the state is now taking another look at, at uh, what happened and launching a new investigation because of this work. So this is just a, a snapshot of some of the newsrooms right now that have public insight journalism, um, these tools, and, and someone dedicated in their newsroom to doing this work. Um, we just signed the Miami Herald. These are mostly public media, public radio partners, but we do have an online newspaper um, in the St. Louis Beacon. We just signed the Miami Herald. We have, we're in discussions with about five other major newspapers in the country, and we think that by December of this coming year, with uh, a little bit of luck and some funding, um, 
PIJ might be actively working and influencing journalism in 40 newsrooms around the country. Um, this is incredible when you think about the network and of this community of practitioners. Not only do we have a network of sources, we have a network of newsrooms that could suddenly collaborate with one another using some of the tools that both Ellen and, and Sunlight Foundation have developed to document cloud, which is a very interesting application that allows people to dissect public documents and, and make comments. Um, so we think the, the possibilities and, and uh, the, the promise of PIJ has, has really yet to be fulfilled. Um, and finally, I'll just say that, uh, you know, this is just a sort of a testimonial, if you will, from Margie Freivogel. Um, she's a longtime journalist, uh, it now uh, started up the St. Louis Beacon, and um, she's, she's pretty hard, hard to impress. But I think she'd be the first one to tell you that the future of news isn't about cheaper journalism, it isn't about citizen journalism, it's about better journalism. And, and that's really what PIJ, I think, is all about. And um, with that, I'll just end, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, that was phenomenal. So now Ellen Miller from Sunlight Foundation. All right, so I confess I'm the one who suggested the Frisbee game. <laughs> and I want to say to Chris that I was not um, at the Center for Responsive Politics when they ordered the cease and desist order. <laughs> and you will be happy to know that um, all of their data is now available through an open API, thanks to funding from the Sunlight Foundation. So uh, things do change in this world, uh, for sure. So let's... <coughs> There'll be some slides coming shortly. Progress. There we are. Uh, so thank you, um, Chris, for, for having me. I, um, I have to confess, this is my very first time at MIT, and I'm just wowed by the architecture of this building and uh, the student presentations that I saw this afternoon. It's just, it's terrific. It will not be my last visit here. Uh, so thank you for having me. So the Sunlight Foundation um, is a, a four-year-old uh, organization that was designed specifically to use the power of the internet to catalyze greater government openness and transparency and to provide new tools and resources to media and citizens alike. Um, we, are, uh, we take our inspiration from Justice Brandeis's famous adage, sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, and we're committed to improving access to government information by making it available online. Indeed, um, redefining what public information means as being online. Um, and by creating new tools and websites and using social media to enable all of us to analyze the information and pull our collective intelligence in improving it. Use of technology as a tool for transparency, engagement, and collaboration is absolutely corn central to everything we do. We've had this a tremendous luxury of having been born four years ago, so we're not a long-standing NGO that has had to make a transition to this new age, and it is, um, it is a terrific luxury. Um, our work falls primarily into five buckets. I see I'm thinking springtime and the beach. Um, digitizing data is core, and advocating for government to do the same building tools and websites on top of that data to make it easier for journalists, citizens, bloggers uh, to use. Um, uh, sorry, citizen engagement and, um, uh, is, uh, a f is our fourth category. And the last one is what I think of as the eating our own dog food category, uh, which is mostly doing media ourselves, becoming a media outlet ourselves. Um, digitizing data is absolutely core to our work. Uh, we fund core data providers because they already do it well. The Center for Responsive Politics, the Institute on Money and State Politics, Taxpayers for Common Sense, um, and several others. And this is, uh, brings into our four um, campaign finance information, lobbying, revolving door, personal financial disclosure, earmarks. This kind of data we refer to as um, influence data, and it's very core to our mission to follow, um, to follow this kind of data. We've created um, new data sets, and I'm going to run through these quickly. We can talk about them later if you like. 
um, such as fedspending.org. This was the first publicly available free database of all government grants and contracts. Subsidyscope.org. This is a project of, actually a project of the Pew Charitable Trust, a project to follow all government subsidies. You've never been able to search them all in one place at one time. The Foreign Lobbyist Influence Tracker. This is a sunlight database which took handwritten paper records and digitized them, one year's worth of these records. These are lobbying forms filled out by individuals uh, who represent foreign governments, creating a database that was never possible um, to, to see before unless you wanted to go to the basement of the Justice Department and you happen to be in Washington somewhere between the hours of nine and five. So this, um, this is uh, also a way for us to put pressure on the Justice Department to actually digitize this information. Another site, Lewis DB. Lewis DB, this is a site Sunlight created that scrapes uh, eight or nine different federal documents such as the congressional record and executive orders and the code of federal regulations that is um, a single search in a single searchable way uh, and a site called party time uh, this is a site that actually tracks the fundraising events aka parties um, and um, so you can follow them there's party time uh, we actually uh, last week uh, posted on a Google map where the parties are by the, uh, I can't remember, uh, Minority Leader Boehner and the second in command, Hoyer. So just to see if they had any overlaps of parties there. Um, we also created databases out of information that the, uh, the White House has made available, the White House visitor logs. They do put this information out on a monthly basis, but it's really difficult to search. So we created a database out of it. And then you can look and see whether Patrick A.B., you could see his Google profile, and if we could scroll over, you could see whether he was listed on several other websites. You could find out actually who it was. And we've created a database out of house expenditure reports. These are office expenses, which Sunlight pressured the House and the Senate to release. The Senate will come um, later this year. Uh, and you can determine how much money actually members of Congress are spending on bottled water in their office or sending flowers or other more important kinds of things. Um, after having built um, and funded a number of, um, of databases, our holy grail is actually to build a data repository to bring these data sets together. Uh, we think of this as a data commons, uh, and this is our beta site called Transparency Data. Right now on this site, you can see for the first time any place a combination, this may be the project you were working on, Chris. Uh, this is all the state and all the federal campaign contributions. So you can search this site with someone's name like T. Boone Pickens, and you can see all of his campaign contributions uh, at the state and federal level. This week we'll be adding lobbying contributions, I mean lobbying expenditures, so you can see whether he was ever a lobbyist, whether he hired a lobbyist, and we will soon add earmarks. You can see whether he received earmarks. To me, this is the, the mashing of these data sets together is really gets you sort of close to the, the holy grail of seeing the, the networks that make up Washington. Um, you know, think as you know, being able to look up an individual and who they funded across the board or the personal investments of members of Congress and whether they received campaign contributions from those interests. This will be a very rich site. Another example of what we're building on top of this data is this site called the National Data Catalog, known as NatDatCat for short. <laughs> so the federal government is now releasing, uh, has a plan actually to release all the federal government data piece by piece and put it on a site called data.gov. And we looked at that and we said, this is great. We really applaud this. However, that's just executive branch data. Where does the regulatory branch data go? Where does the congressional data go? Where does the municipal or the state data, all of which is coming online in increasing amounts? So we created the National Data Catalog, which will actually be a catalog. The last site I showed you is a repository. We're bringing all the data in. This is actually going to be a catalog, which will be curated and uh, tagged so that you can search according to your interest. You can say Kentucky, environmental data, 
um, city of Louisville, and you can see anything that would have pertained to that, whether it comes from a federal source or from um, a state or local county uh, source. Again, this, is, uh, this site is in, I would say, alpha uh, phase, but it is actually functioning, and this is a participatory source, so we're, we will be asking citizens uh, from around the country to contribute data to this. It will be vetted. Um, and um, but we expect it to become a very rich source as we are seeing a torrent of new federal data across the board in terms of issue and topic. We are also, uh, to make uh, use of this even easier, building a series of widgets uh, based on the very same data. It's another way to display it and web services that make it easier for journalists and bloggers to add all of these rich resources to their websites. I would say this is in pre-alpha. Lots of things in the pipeline. This work, this data-focused work, really sloshes over into the second bucket of our work, which is the development of, of uh, tools and websites to enable citizens to quickly grasp and understand the data. One example of this is our flagship site called opencongress.org. This is a joint project with Sunlight and the Participatory Politics Foundation. This is a site that makes congressional legislative information uh, easily accessible because it's all open source, open code. We woke up one morning and found a site which said open mass. And it was all the Massachusetts data just dumped literally into, into this. And we are in the process now of developing um, an initial five state-based sites like this as an experiment to see if we can roll this out to all 50 states. Or you can go to a site like this called Congrelate, a tool where you can mix and match data sets of your choosing. We'll give you a panoply of them and you can decide what you want to look at. This is called uh, Congrelate, obviously about congressional information. Or a site like this called Capital Words. Um, and this is a website that takes the entire congressional record every single day and creates a, an algorithm through, by which they can, it, it can sort and determine the single most frequently spoken word of the day. And you can use this site to see what your legislator might have said on that particular day. And you can search by Congress, you can search by yesterday, by month. It's, it's actually fun, but also quite interesting because you can see fascinating political patterns. Or we do things that are a little bit more fun like this, which is an augmented reality app. Uh, this one, we have plot, plotted recovery.gov projects. And you can see them as you walk down the street. I actually haven't tried it here in Boston. Uh, I have it on my iPhone. Um, but uh, so if you are interested in what's going on in your neighborhood, you could download, um, uh, you could look at this. We also just plotted those parties that lawmakers whole ha are having in the, uh, the same augmented reality app. And so if you're walking in Washington, you can see where the parties are. Um, we uh, are into the mobile app space as well. This one uh, is for the iPhone called Real Time Congress. I showed this to a member of Congress earlier this week, and he downloaded it immediately while we were talking, and he looked at it. This provides all kinds of information about what's happening in Congress right now. He looked at it, looked at his staff, and he said, I don't need you anymore. <laughs> Um, I'm not, the staff was horrified, of course. Uh, we have an Android app that's been uh, downloaded 10,000 times, so there, these, these do seem to be of, of some interest. And this is our latest tool for journalists, uh, which is called Recovery Explorer. Um, it's not our prettiest um, site, but it may be among our most useful. So all this data comes from recovery.gov, and in this application, you can actually drill down to the recipient um, uh, by state, by department, um, it's, it's really quite an extraordinary tool for, for reporters. Um, Sunlight um, has always been into the engagement business. Um, we, we know and we have, we have known from the very beginning that it, they're uh, critically important to our work, to, to the huge task we have of making government more transparent. Um, our Sunlight Labs has uh, successfully developed and engaged a community of over 2,000 developers 
uh, with government data. We've done this through two Apps for America contests, and we just launched our most recent contest, which we should talk about sometime, Chris, called Design for America. Uh, which is a, a proactive attempt to reach out to designers, again, to engage with government, um, with government data. Our open house and open Senate projects have engaged experts and citizens in identifying easy ways for uh, the House and the Senate to use technology to become more transparent. Uh, and we, of course, discover the same thing that Linda has discovered, which is when we do these lists, you know, there's the retired ex who spent 25 years you know, working in Congress who knows, you know, every rule, every regulation, and they now live on the West Coast. But through the, uh, through the groups that we've, we've, we've developed, we can get their expertise and, um, and help, they very much help contribute to uh, the kinds of things we advocate for. We've, we've held um, two transparency camps, uh, which usually have a mix of uh, developers, government, citizen activists, um, and, in fact, we have one next weekend, uh, if people are interested um, in signing up for it. Uh, we've launched an ongoing platform for distributed research called Transparency Core, a place for citizens to engage in ongoing research with us. And all of these sites are driven towards nurturing communities to get them more engaged, um, either directly themselves or with sunlight. And our latest effort, which was actually launched this afternoon, um, is, um, is this project uh, a campaign, the Public Equals Online campaign, what we hope will catalyze a transparency movement around the U.S. of citizens advocating for online, real-time access to government data. Um, much of this work, um, this is supposed to be a slide of transparent Washington, is the best we could do. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, much of this work it really is, uh, is done in a way to promote a legislative agenda that we have developed really over the last couple of years. Um, we, we like what we do. We like creating databases. We like creating tools and interfaces uh, for citizens. But we actually have this radical notion that it's government's responsibility to do it themselves. Uh, we'll, we'll take it and, and push it to the next uh, the next degree, but but government is responsible, uh, and so we have been working very closely and meet regularly with um, uh, the staff at the White House uh, on their open government directive. Uh, we work uh, very closely with uh, members of Congress. Uh, we have catalyzed a transparency caucus in Congress, which was just announced earlier this week, and we've helped um, introduce a new bill uh, this week, a piece of legislation called the Public Online Information Act and are working with lawmakers as well to enhance earmark disclosure. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised to hear we favor systemic lobby reform, which means online real-time reporting, and a dramatically enhanced online disclosure of campaign finance information, particularly in the wake of the recent Supreme Court decision, Citizens United. Uh, the final bucket of our work um, is really to practice what we preach, uh, becoming a media outlet ourselves. Um, that's the eating our own dog food um, side of what we do. So this is a shot of our homepage, um, where on our homepage we host six different blogs with rapid-fire commentary um, from uh, maybe eight or nine different bloggers, uh, most of the staff blogs in one direction or another. another. Uh, we have one website that's actually just devoted to our reporting called the Reporting Group uh, website. And this is a site that has a number of interesting features, uh, not only a, a Twitter stream from the staff of this uh, particular group, but it has a real-time ticker, so as new data is released, it is actually appears on this site as well. Um, we uh, develop um, regular visualizations of our work. This is one that shows um, Senator Max Baucus's former staff connections and where they now work in the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry. Got a lot of attention. Uh, this is one, uh, people who understand what's happening with the health care bill using a reconciliation process. Um, a lot of hypocrisy about whether Republicans voted for bills under reconciliation or Democrats. We said, well, let's just do a graphic. And so we did. Um, so we see this as part of our, our own media. The, um, 
The most exciting thing I think we have done, uh, indeed some have called it game changing, is what we did during the healthcare summit that occurred recently. We called this Sunlight Live, and apparently we used it again today. Um, so uh, what you see is an embeddable video of the healthcare summit. And to the right of that um, were industry donors to the person who was speaking. So we had an editor in the room who would put up uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, leading donors to the members of Congress or how much money they received from the healthcare interest, et cetera, constantly feeding data into this. We had a live blog just below this um, in which uh, four or five staff were just throwing data and throwing information uh, on, uh, you know, onto the screen. And then we had, of course, the, the tweet stream um, there. And it was an experiment for sunlight. I mean, we ended up, uh, one of our staff called it data jamming. Because if you watched, if anybody watched the healthcare debate, what you saw on cable news was, you know, who was up and who was down and, you know, who was lying and who wasn't lying. And we just, we just pushed it aside and we said, there is data here. We should let the data do the talking. We had no idea if it would work. But in fact, it worked remarkably well. Um, we had um, 50,000 people watching the debate on our site. Uh, we had nearly 10,000 people participating in the live blog. Um, several, um, several thousand leaving actually comments or interacting with us, asking us particular questions. Um, we had 1,300 tweets sent out linking um, us, or linking to us, more than the White House got linked to, I might add. And of course, if we added up the number of people reached by those 1,300 tweets, it was 25 million people. No, I'm sorry, it was 2.5 million people. <laughs> Even so, a silly number. But, but I think it, it gives you some illustration of how we use social media to promote what we're doing. Um, that's um, really an overview of what we do, and I'd be glad to talk about you know, any piece of it. In closing, I just want to say that that uh, we believe that the new technology is pushing the power to the edges. Uh, and it may be the only thing that can challenge or indeed break Washington's golden rule. So thank you. Well, I uh, want to thank you both for you know two really riveting talks. Um, uh, we're really honored that you could join us. And um, you know, I guess when I framed the event, I uh, I had originally thought that I would frame it as something like sunlight comes uh, uh, and, and essentially takes information from the top down from the federal and the governmental level and makes that accessible to the public and public uh, inside journalism on the other hand takes kind of information from the public, uh, pulls it together through journalists and then you know, brings it back out. Um, but in fact, you know, both of what you're doing defies that kind of simple reduction. Um, uh, so, you know, so I found I find your your actual talks of the many many different ways that the information is being used and personalized by people and, and thought through different social processes to be really really interesting. Um, I guess um, I I'd start Linda with a question for you that that uh, you know actually will be relevant to both of you probably, which is. Um, that you describe this in, in some ways as a catalyst for collaboration. Um, uh, and and you, you talk about the role uh, the journalists have taken through this process by you know, taking these uh, uh, stories or uh, uh, feedback from people, and you contrast it with what you call the catch, catch and release model, uh, where a journalist call, you know, goes through their Rolodex, uh, which is often a very uh, tight Rolodex, or sometimes you know, reaches into the phone directory and brings in experts to comment on a particular you know, project. And I think you showed several really interesting different ways that this goes beyond that typical, what I would maybe call catch, um, misrepresent, and then release uh, model. I'm talking about you, Wall Street Journal, but um, but but so so you know so what, what I'm curious about though is that um, you know how much do you see this as an intermediary step? I mean, do you think that uh, the the role of journalists is increasingly changing because you have access to these databases? Um, uh, in the case of Ellen, she's making a lot of data that would have taken a lot of work of a concentrated person to have to go dig out, you know, nine to five in D.C. to be able to access it. 
increasingly that data is becoming public, and increasingly we're also seeing that a lot of news gathering seems to be happening through distributed means, as, as you know, blogs are doing document dumps and asking for their own collaborators. So, so to some degree, I'm, I'm curious, do you see the role of journalism changing, and, and you know, does it, do, do you still need the journalist to do that refining and storytelling, or do you see it more as a collaborative process like in those smaller newspapers that you started out in? Well, I, I do think there's a role for journalists. I think I there's a I think journalism is changing, and our definition of journalism is changing. But um, there there is always a need for sense makers, for people who see and are. I mean, I think the problem is is that we have reporters because of technology have actually become in many cases handcuffed to their desks and to their computers and they're not out in their communities and they're not talking to as many people as they used to and therefore there's an echo chamber that has developed. Um, you know, I spent, you know, 18 years as a reporter and as, a, as an editor and there's a reason people have, journalists have usual suspects. It's because they've vetted them. In many cases they know what their conflicts of interest are. They, um, they know to some degree when they're bull being uh, they're they're bullshitting them, uh, and so they this is and they turn to these people because they've built built some trust. But unfortunately, that has really cut off um, access. So I would say that uh, yes, it's changing, and it's it's changing as we speak right now. So will will things always um, you know will will citizens just become their own reporters? Um, I don't know. I will say that the people that we talk to in our network don't want to do our jobs for us. They tell us that. They are they want to be invited into the process and they want to share what they know and they're tired of seeing a story on TV or reading it in the newspaper or on a website and saying they got it wrong, why didn't they ask me, and yet they feel like they have no no invitation to be part of the process. Um, and I'll just finish by saying that I am constantly amazed at how little demands they make on us. We're constantly asking them for their knowledge and their expertise, but even our own capacity, if we use their insights for every story we do on the radio, um, it would still uh, not come close to unearthing the insights that they've given us. Rarely does a source say, why wasn't, why wasn't I interviewed by a reporter? Why didn't you do a story based on what I told you? They just say, thank you for asking, thank you for, um, for listening, which is, is really key. So I think there is a role for journalists. I think it's constantly changing, um, and they need to be very open to this idea that there are other people out there doing what they used to only be the ones doing. So let me just do a really quick follow-up, which is, um, you know, that uh, there's a, uh, I think we're both founded, uh, funded by the Knight Foundation, um, uh, and, and one of the other projects that they funded was a project called Media Bugs, which was um, a very interesting project that borrows a metaphor from software design, which is a bug tracking system, uh, much like a ticketing system in a lot of other businesses, but basically uh, when someone has a, when their application crashes or there's something, uh, uh, you're, you're getting a template error on a website, um, and you can't explain it, then uh, basically you submit a bug and the bug says this is an open bug, it's assigned to someone and they basically have to respond to it. And so this media bug project is basically about how do you uh, actually get a newspaper to be responsible for things that they've mispublished, misinformed. Are you finding that this kind of collaborative approach where uh, you have this database of people who you have long-term interactions with is forcing you to be more responsible to your readers? Um, it, Media Bugs was created because lots of people send letters to the editor saying you got a factual error and there's never a, 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 something published to acknowledge that by the paper. Um, uh, are, you, are, are you finding that that's something that you uh, are in the situation of less um, because you're in more feedback or...? Well, I wish I could say that that were it were a total open process that way. Um, I, in that, yes, in some ways, just being available and accessible to people and having dedicated people in a newsroom whose job it is to interface with the public automatically brings that information closer to the newsroom. So reporters and editors get feedback all the time. They get emails saying you got this wrong or what have you, or maybe the web editor. But when you have a devoted a person devoted in your newsroom to really talking and listening to the public and then they carry that information, I think it, it does bring um, a little more 
uh, uh, pressure to bear to, to correct that information. Um, I will say in the future, the way we envision some of our tools right now, um, it's a very transactional relationship that we have with the public. We ask them, they respond. Um, we see in the not too distant future a, a much more transparent form of journalism almost where people with the insights can come in and they can actually add to a story that's already been created, even the people who might have been interviewed for that story. As we all know, reporters take a fraction of what they get from a source and put it into a story. There's always so much more to the story. Why not provide an avenue for people to come in and say, Yes, and here's what I, here's uh, just another point that I might add to that and invite the public. It's not quite wiki news, but we do think that there needs to be greater interaction and greater openness and transparency just with the journalistic process. Great, amazing. Um, we'll be taking questions in about 10 minutes or so. Um, uh, and so, Ellen, uh, this is sort of related, but um, you know, as you're increasingly moving, I mean, well, so my first question is, is there anything that you guys don't do? Um, <laughs> but it's a rhetorical question, so I'll just move on. So um, the second question is, you know, you're, you're moving from a space where uh, you're putting data online and these, you know, uh, it looks like you've got a web application. You probably have several different protocols by which developers can access it through an API. Um, but you're increasingly saying that, uh, you know, design is really critical. Um, fostering these challenges for people to design with the data, building designs yourself. And I guess, you know, I, one of the questions I had was, after you've done this now for a few years and, and have thought about it for a very long time, uh, what are the principles by which you um, think about these designs? How do you recognize uh, what an important design process is? Like you showed the augmented reality iPhone app. I wouldn't have thought about that. I'm not sure I would use it or if I would survive crossing the street if I did, but, um, but I guess the question is what are the kind of design principles that you've come up with so far and what are the designs targeted towards? What kinds of interactions are the best designs targeted towards? Well, you know, they, when it comes to um, sort of uh, influence data and understanding the connections, the, uh, the web or the, you know, uh, one of my <laughs> colleagues used to say, if you could inject a dye into the bloodstream of Washington, where would it flow? The interconnections are so complex that even your best writer has trouble articulating them in a way that doesn't lose the most ardent reader. And so for us, uh, to the degree we can, and this is one area where we actually are, you know, we'll be adding staff this year, is this whole visualization um, and, you know, info infographic sort of approach to our work, we know we will reach a lot more people. A picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, it's not, there's no sort of fundamental principle, and there's really one test in our office about whether it works. If Ellen doesn't get it within 10 seconds, you got to go back to the drawing board. I mean, this is actually, it's known as the Ellen test. It's written in a public wiki. So whenever a new website or visualization you know, is developed, I, it has to pass my test. And, and I'm a fairly high-end user. But, but for us, um, explaining you know, complicated relationships which are at the heart of Washington or any state capital uh, through a visualization is absolutely key. And so we're trying to move more and more in that direction. So I, I love your analogy of blood in the die or die in the blood and um, and and it you know in the bloodstream and it, it you know inevitably it ends up in the sewer. Um, but I you know I think one of the questions I know that you guys have uh, funded and I think worked with littlesys.org, um, you know which is kind of interesting because they take this graph node model of representing these connections, which is of course what the uh, NSA and, and different intelligence organizations started doing after 9-11, moving away from traditional databases and starting looking at connective databases. And I guess that that leads to kind of two questions for me. One is, what areas of professional expertise, if you, if you assume that the, the old user of this data would be an investigative journalist or uh, a regulator or someone from a, um, yeah, a public prosecutor, um, what kinds of professional expertise are you drawing in from now or looking to draw in from in the near future? Well, it's, um, I mean, the, the, um, the reason for the visualizations, I think, is uh, to reach to a more popular citizen-focused audience. I mean, we, we actually do believe that um, citizens can go to a site like Transparency Data uh, or the next version of it, which is, which is more, um, you know, easy, uh, well, have a, an easier interface um, on it, and, um, and, and become their own investigative journalists. Now, they are not their own investigators, not to say they're being investigative journalists, but the, um, 
it's sort of the combination of, under, of the availability of data, the, com, the combining of data with, uh, combined with social media and the ability to talk directly to your legislator sort of says, well, we should be designing for this kind of constituency who will turn around and send an email or tweet or comment on a member's Facebook page and say, you just gave an earmark to Corporation X and you took money from that corporation, explain yourself. I mean, until you know, the social media became as, as, as prevalent and as part of our daily life for so many people, you, you couldn't have that sort of immediacy um, of it. And so that's the kind of constituency that we're, we're really trying to, to pull towards. Okay, excellent. I have one more question for you, and then we'll open it up. Uh, so uh, uh, if, if I could ask the audience to use the two microphones on either side so that the uh, online audience will be able to hear you later. Um, so the last question uh, is completely uh, self-indulgent. Uh, uh, I, I just want to know, what can we expect from Citizen United? What, how is that going to change the game? <laughs> she says with a deep sigh. Um, it, it is very hard to predict what the Supreme Court decision Citizens United uh, will have. I mean, essentially, I don't know if people are aware of it, what it said was that corporations can spend any amount of money any way they want directly. And, and prior to Citizens United, there were barriers set up. They had to spend it through a political action committee, or they had to spend it um, uh, through another organization. So now they can spend it directly. Uh, my own prediction uh, with respect to political spending is that corporations will not, for the most part, get into direct spending. Because if I am Home Depot, uh, and I really don't like you as a candidate, and I spend $250,000 against your candidacy, I could lose a lot of business, and I don't know how much business I could lose. So I might give it to uh, the Citizens Against Chris uh, as a conduit. Check it out online. <laughs> as a conduit. So for us, uh, for sunlight, from Sunlight's perspective, you, we must have real online, you know, real-time online disclosure so we can follow actually what the corporations do, whether they do spend it directly or whether they use um, conduit spending. I think the most nefarious um, impact of the decision might be that the lobbyist from Home Depot, just to use an example, um, will have an extra something in their arguments for members of Congress. And if I were a member of Congress, knowing how timid they all are already, and I'm asked to support an amendment, I will think twice or three or four times before I say no, because perhaps this corporation will go into my district and spend $250,000 and try to knock me off. Okay, great. So uh, Charles Dattar, could do you have a question? Oh, William Riccio first. There we go. Okay. Sure. So um, what, it strikes me that a core question here, a core, a core issue is redaction, right? The more information we have, the greater the challenge of trying to parse out what precisely we need. The tools, Ellen, that you talked about look great in terms of helping, you know, offering a number of different ways to crack this data and make something of it. Um, and yet we're at a moment where in terms of public discourse, the, the things are kind of more simplistic than ever. It's big headlines, it's CNN and Fox kinds of highly simplistic, highly polarized debates. At a moment when we have these affordances that give us a huge amount of data that require fairly nuanced um, analytic strategies and fairly nuanced redactional strategies to make some sense out of them. So I guess my question is what do we, how do you see, these are, these are amazing sources, how can we enhance their use? How can we get more people to actually make critical use of these resources? Is this an educational problem? Is this a problem of public culture? Where do you see, well, I see barriers to the use of this. I mean, you may be satisfied with the numbers you're getting, but if we were to try to enhance use of this, what might we do? Where might we look to sort of get a more alert and active and redactionally uh, aware public? I think um, terrific questions to which I do not have the answers, um, I'll say at the outset. Uh, clearly, the success of this um, lies in uh, broader and broader citizen engagement. We have to in, in, enlarge the circles of people who are used to um, uh, you know, in interacting with this information. We have to get it into people's hands. They have to know that it's there when they want to use it. I mean, I think the brilliance of what Linda has done has been to create a community which is growing, I don't know at what rate, but 
um, to, to make sure that there are core users in each community who know that data and information you know, is available. What we are witnessing with the American government is a huge cultural transformation with respect to opening up their data. I mean, the nonprofits are just learning that they have to open up their data as well. And so um, I think that we have to understand that the government holds data that is of interest to us. Um, we were discussing the other day that you know the um, Department of Transportation or FAA has had data on on uh, collisions of airplanes with birds for years. Who knew? Who cared? Right? Until we have you know a plane crash. Um, and so the first, I think, the first goal, at least for us, is to get the data there and then to begin to figure out what's of use to people and direct people in the direct in that direction. It is an educational process for sure. If I can just intervene for a second. Word engagement is a crucial word, important word, and yet we're living in a, at a moment when there seems to be a highly engaged public in the, the tea drinkers out there who seem really resist, who seem very good at sort of replicating a, a discourse they're given. They're highly engaged but not critical. Highly engaged but not actually looking carefully at the data or if they are, I don't know what data they're looking at. So um, it strikes me that engagement is a crucial preliminary stance but it really doesn't get at least looking at what's happening right now, it doesn't seem to get very far in terms of turning engagement into critical engagement. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it is a challenge, I, I would agree with you. And, and from, from our point of view, if you can put the data out there, perhaps you can change the nature of the conversation. And that's what we were trying to do through that Sunlight Live experiment. I'd just like to add just two points. One is, I think we could do a better job of asking people what kind of government information they want. I think we simply presume, because we're interested in journalists and certain kinds of information, that that's, you know, what people really care about. And I know that it's heresy to say this, but I'm maybe, maybe there are a certain number of people out there who have kind of accepted that money influences politics, and we just keep cramming to them that it shouldn't. Um, so I think we can start by asking people a little more about what kind of information they want access to and uh, not solely just provide them what they ask for. And the second thing is, is that certainly with the creation of Budget Hero, I mean, our idea there was who is going to read the federal budget? Not Congress. I mean, let alone their constituents. And so but not everyone can spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to create a serious game that takes CBO scoring for all of these public policy options and then hires reporters to go out and, pr and create the, the, the pro, the con, and the social impact statement and then hire the coders to put it all and then a designer to put it in some sort of interactive, you know, gaming format. I don't know that that's a long-term strategy, but behind it, it was make it, make it fun, make it interesting, um, give people information in a way that they can absorb it and understand it. And so I think what Ellen was saying about data visualization and some of these other techniques, this isn't just shiny object, you know, kind of gadget journalism. There's a real purpose to being able to deliver information in an engaging way. Um, and, and, and a quick, and it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, during the, uh, the Al Franken, Norm Coleman Senate recount that went on and on and on for months, one of the things that that process did is that it allowed us to take a look at actual ballots that are cast, which none of us would ever have access to or maybe even the inclination to see. And um, because there were all these disputed ballots. So we were able to take them all and put them online and allow people to be the judge of who should get the vote. And what was crazy about that is what people do in the voting booth. They draw pictures. They initial things. Oh, I didn't want to vote for that person. And if you put any kind of identifying marks on a ballot, it disqualifies it. But who knew that until we actually, and so we did a very simple thing. You be the judge. We'd show them the ballot. We couldn't figure out who that person vote for, but you would get to take a crack at it. That helped them understand what those judges were going through on a daily basis, and it cut in, it cut beyond the rhetoric of of you know Franken's doing this and Coleman's doing that, and his camp has influenced the judges this way and this way. It actually put the citizen right in the middle of the process. So that would be my answer: is that you know we just have to. I mean, sadly, we do have to make it interesting. Ryan O'Toole. Uh, so uh, thanks for the really engaging discussion. Um, this question is for Ellen. Uh, so you said just now that your primary purpose is just to get the data out there and then to figure out how to direct it or what to do with it. And maybe I missed it in all of the websites uh, that you showed, but w what kinds of activities are you supporting that are more directed? Um, 
I mean, there there is this like politics built into what you're doing, which is about data sharing and and you know public disclosure. But I'm I'm guessing that gets used by people who have a, a variety of conflicting politics. So um, you know, do you support those kinds of activities uh, directly, even you know the, now that you're supporting them indirectly? The um, uh, I should say you raise a, a really good point that uh, that our uh, allies in in the fight for greater government transparency. Uh, come from both the conservative political side of the spectrum and the liberal side of the spectrum. It's it's fascinating. I've never worked on an issue that that had that kind of salience um, across the political spectrum. Um, to date, uh, Sunlight's funding has been just in two areas, and, and it's a relatively small part of our budget, actually smaller and smaller part of our budget. Uh, we have funded uh, people who digitize data. Literally, that's what they do. Uh, some of the groups that I mentioned, um, and we've funded people who have interesting ideas for building tools and websites to access that data. So the project that Chris referred to, littlesys.org, or um, the Participatory Politics uh, Foundation to Create Open Congress. Some of these are joint efforts. Some of them are just out-and-out uh, -out grants. Um, and to date, we have not funded any activism around using the data. But the campaign that we announced today, the Public Equals Online campaign, is really designed to be a grassroots campaign uh, for people who want to work on getting greater government transparency at the municipal level, at the state level, at the federal level. And while we will certainly use that campaign to help support some of our own legislative initiatives, we will be, uh, or at least we're thinking of making small grants to people in various communities who have ideas of ways to pressure their governments, city councils, on up uh, to uh, to create more transparency, whether that's you know for data or engagement or uh, you know using technology for collaboration. So we will be looking into that. But like much of what Sunlight does, uh, you know, it will be an experiment. We'll we'll have to sort of figure that out as we go along. Thanks, Charles Guitar. Um Question that's uh, slightly related to his question, but uh, so from an information theory perspective, information is something you don't necessarily want. It's noise. I mean, white noise carries more information than speech, for example. Um, and if you imagine the limits of both of the projects you're working on, if you had seven billion people in your Rolodex to call, or if you had high definition video and audio of every square inch of Washington and every municipal government all at once, this wouldn't be very useful to anyone. And the thing that's powerful about what each of you are doing is the narratives that get constructed through that data. And so from a, an aspirational angle or looking forward to an ideal world, um, who would you say should be controlling the narrative and how should they be controlling that narrative? <laughs> wow. I was gonna say mumble something about journalists. So <laughs> Linda, why don't you? <laughs> You know, I don't know. I don't know who should control it. I should. I could say that I think that it should be more people who control it now. Um, in fact, you know, it's. It's. I'm glad you brought that that point up. People. I hear people all the time say, "Well, you know, especially um, people in the in the journalism reform movement that you know journalism needs to be more like a conversation." Well, I don't think journalism is a conversation. I, I don't think it's a lecture either. And um, so, you know. I, you know, I think that there has to be some people who are paid to do this work. I think some people will be passionate about it, but at some point it's hard. Good journalism is hard work. Um, so often the information that we get as we solicit with some open-ended questions from people in the network, we don't have people going, you ought to look at this. There's a real scandal going on here. There's really something terrible here or, or something. We just have people who tell us stuff that they don't even know it might be newsworthy. So it takes someone to read that and kind of have that sense of journalistic curiosity and then the means both um, you know, uh, the time and the means to follow up and figure out where that story really is. So I think that there, you know, we need a robust media. We need paid journalists. I think uh, you know, that's becoming increasingly more difficult as news organizations struggle financially and lay people off. I don't know what's going to fill the void. I mean, as Clay Shirky says, you know, we're in the middle of a revolution where the old model has been tossed out before we know what's going to replace it. So I, I, I just don't know the answer to that. Yeah. And I think um, I react a little bit to the notion of who's going to control 
This the control um, has been, I think, for too long in a very narrow set of hands who have now lost control, and that is mostly a good thing, at least at the moment it's a good thing, that you know, not all you know, that not all news flows through the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune, um, you know, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, so the fact that there are, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of bloggers out there, some of whom nobody's ever heard of, but I follow every day until I get bored with them, and then I get rid of them, and I find somebody else who's writing interesting stuff. To me, that is, um, you know, it's 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 small d democracy, and and it's very exciting to see it now. You know, am I going to take a fact on something from an unknown blogger? No, I'm. You know, I'm going to double check it. But but this is a very exciting time. You know, in you know, sort of the the uh, the civic education and participation of people and, and technology is, is what fuels it. So I'm I'm not so. I mean, I sort of like the fact that you know control is, you know, has moved beyond. You know, like who's going to control the data? Well. I should control the data, right? Government should make it available, and I should be able to filter what I want. And there should be easy ways to search for it. So, again, if I'm interested in immigration, I should be able to type in a website, immigration, and get all the data about immigration, whether it's you know state-based or federal-based. So it's that kind of um, um, you know new approach to you know you know to lack of control that I think is very important and very exciting. Hi, um, I just want to say that I really respect and admire what you're both accomplishing right now, um, and I think it really contributes to the shifting landscapes in our understanding of information and journalism. Um, and I wanted, my question is for you, Linda. Um, with Public Insight Network, I wanted to understand in the context of conversations about citizen journalism and social media, um, where everything exploded, everyone said everyone's a journalist, and I sense a bit of a back, not a backlash, but kind of a coming back to center where there's an understanding or respect that journalism is a craft and that you need those voices, but they also need to be more open and more um, listen, listen to people more, as you say. Um, I was wondering with the network where it seems like people are submitting their, their stories and their ideas directly, I, you know, from my understanding of the network and, and your presentation, what are the expectations you find from the people who do submit their stories? Do they, you, you mentioned this a little bit, but do they want follow-up? Do they want to be tracked? Do they want to be notified, credited when their stories are used? Do they have an expectation of privacy or an expectation that you'll share their information and their names openly? And, you know, what are the practices that you and your team have developed to kind of a, to navigate this new space, and kind of as a related question, how do the newsrooms handle that? Are they getting the message from you guys, and are they adopting the network? Are they over adopting it? Um, are they using it, relying on it too much, and not getting out enough? And then, are they respecting the rules that you've set in place when they use it? Yes to all of that. Um, <laughs> well, I'll start by just explaining a few fundamentals. So. Um, not having been around when PIJ was formulated, but I think I can kind of figure out what the principles at play here were. It's uh, based on an assumption or a bias toward confidentiality. So everything everyone shares with us is confidential. It's not published unless they give us explicit permission to do so. And so we get that permission in a number of ways. And now it's also um, implicit that a reporter can contact them. It says so in, in every message that a reporter or producer may, may contact you to follow up. Now, we don't have perfect information on all 83,000 people in the network. Um, much, you know, there are a certain amount of information they have to supply, an email address, and most of the, um, the I mean, they can come into the network through some of the serious games. It's a very low barrier to, to joining the network. The key is in the follow up. Um, so, for starters, um, every person who, who signs up for the network gets a thank you note, and they generally get a few of the queries or the, the kind of journalistic questions that we might be working on. Everyone who responds to a query gets a thank you note, and it's not just sort of an automatic generated thing. It's the analyst who, who actually issued that query um, will provide some synopsis of, of what c came of it. Um, without violating, you know, when they're not quoting, you know, um, Joe Citizen over here in the 
this community, but they're saying, you know, here's kind of what we learned from this query, and by the way, here are links to two stories that came from it. So if it actually results in a story, everyone who responded gets a link, gets, you know, unless it's, you know, so far down the line, which gets me to the next part, which is how the newsrooms adopt it. Um, um, you know, we're, we're seven years in and we're still, we're still learning new applications and we're still fighting newsroom cultures. I mean, the truth is, and this, I don't see this ever changing, um, you know, part of the, the, the thrill of journalism is the aphrodisiac of discovery. It's the reporter knocking on the door and being invited in and finding this incredible world on the other side and a story, and they get to bring that to light and they get to follow up on it. Um, it to the extent that public insight journalism does some of that, takes some of that away or does that some of that for them, you know, there's a little something lost there. So if you're the journalist on the other side of a pitch from a story that comes from an analyst who's been talking to a lot of people, you may have ten stories you can't get to already. That may just be seen as another story on the pile of what you might want to get to. So there's a lot of salesmanship that goes on in what we do. I mean, we have to, we do reporting, we don't just sort of say, hey, here's five things people told us, do what you want with them. Um, some reporters and editors truly embrace it. Um, again, this idea that you can do prospecting, you can test a hunch as opposed to source finding, which is anyone can say, I used to get these emails as a reporter, does anybody know anyone who? And I got this, this it was very frightening one day when I woke up and realized that a number of stories in the newspaper were built on journalists and people journalists knew, personally. Um, so this has put an end to that. I mean, very, no one sends out emails that say, hey, does anyone know anyone who's going through foreclosure? Because we have a whole network of people that we can look for. But, um, but it gets getting better and it's getting more exciting. The idea that we can use the network in some incredibly creative ways, um, you know, to, uh, you know, we've used a um, click fix. See click fix. See click fix. Um, I mean, Boston did a, I mean, I think the Globe did a, a great pothole project. I mean, that just makes it very easy. What was interesting about that is that the public officials who are responsible for fixing those potholes get emails, and we get a really nasty email from the public works director in St. Paul saying, well, I'm getting all of these emails, and, and it tried to go in and kind of fix all the potholes so he wouldn't get any more, or someone on his staff did, um, until they said, no, you can't do that. Um, so there's a lot of high touch with PIJ. I don't know if we're going to be able to sustain that when we get to um, half a million people. Um, that's why it's really critical for us to put more control in the hands of, of the actual source, of the person out there. Instead of waiting for us to email them a survey, they have access and there's some collaborative filtering that suggests things to them based on what they've told us about themselves. Um, so, uh, and and our, our strategy is not to prescribe to newsrooms that use this tool, these tools in this network, how to do it. Um, and then I'll say one final thing. Yes, it can turn journalists into lazy journalists because if, if all you have to do is sort of dial a source whenever you want, the idea is it actually could preclude you from maybe doing a little more. So that's really up to newsrooms to manage the expectations and to really think creatively about, um, you know, how they might use this to do news gathering. How many people now staff the network? Well, at, um, for, mo for the most part, outside of American public media newsrooms, it's one analyst, one newsroom. In some cases, it's one analyst, two newsrooms. In the case of the St. Louis Beacon, they are jointly building um, a network and accessing it with KETC Channel 9. The Miami Herald will be working in conjunction with WLRN Public Radio. Um, we're, we're now, uh, actually next week, it'll, uh, this will be announced that the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is funding several local journalism centers, which are basically a handful of public radio stations, all who will hire a reporter to do blogging and reporting around um, a certain topic area. So um, we have one analyst who will be part of an agribusiness reporting network. In that case, it's one analyst in five newsrooms. So it really depends. At American Public Media, where it was developed, just Marketplace, the, the business show, has three analysts. So that's quite a, a different ratio. Um, and at uh, Minnesota Public Radio, we have four analysts that in some capacity are doing something. But not all of them are just querying the network. We have one analyst who does nothing but blog full time on the economy based on insights that come in from people in the network. We have um, one person who focuses solely on outreach. So if we have, um, if we know we need to reach people and we, we have a big gap in our network, we actively go out and find them. 
Republicans. When the Republican National Convention came to town, we knew we would need more conservatives. So we sought them and we brought them into the tent. So it, it, it really depends. But for the most part, it's kind of right now one analyst, one newsroom. It's cool to hear you guys say that Democrats and Republicans seem excited about transparency in government. Um, but transparency seems uh, antagonistic to those in power. Um, can you talk about how you make a pitch to someone who's in office um, to get them to support um, open records laws and other transparency efforts? Or do you actually leverage that by bribing them with, uh, or you know, threatening them with dirt that you've already uncovered? <laughs> it's a tough sell, I have to say, in Congress. Um, the uh, we we often talk about the, the the notion that Congress has erected a firewall around itself, and so you know nothing goes out, nothing comes in, uh, but it, but it's breaking down. I mean, I think uh, from our point of view, the whole notion of um, transparency as a popular position, people in the country like transparent government. When Sunlight was founded four years ago, and we haven't done any polling, we asked uh, a series of questions about. You know, would you like to see members of Congress disclose this, disclose that, et cetera, et cetera. And any, everything we polled, and this was a, a bipartisan conducted poll, and uh, equal number of Democrats and Republicans responded, um, they all said yes. 80% said yes to everything that we could possibly, we, we could possibly move. So um, it, it is not an easy sell with Congress because information is power. They get that, right? And we're asking them to let go of information, which is to release power. I mean, it's, you know, it's not unlike journalists. I mean, maybe it's down a notch or two. But, you know, the, the notion of what do you mean citizens can actually contribute to my, my, uh, my journalism, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a wearing away. The, the fascinating thing for me, because I've spent so many decades in Washington, has been the new administration's stance with respect to greater transparency. And so we have uh, been encouraged by them. And I actually think, you know, I, I mean, I see our strategy shifting somewhat because the administration has made a number of very important steps. They're not perfect by any means, and they still do a lot that's not real transparency, but what, stuff that we've put into the category of transparency theater. But we, you know, it was day two of the administration when the president issued a directive and he said, you know, give me a memo, OMB, within X number of days and tell me how we're going to use technology for transparency, collaboration, and engagement. That's a flag in the ground against we, which we can measure uh, progress. And so there's, there have been enough uh, positive steps forward. The wind sometimes blows from the White House down to the Capitol. And I think that with the general cultural change of how we expect to access information, whether it's, you know, or make an airplane reservation or order a pair of shoes or whatever we want to do online, the expectation they'll be able to know more about the government officials is having an impact on them. Um, you know, it, the, the argument that we would make is, A, this is a good way to connect with your constituents. B, people want this. You can't hide from it any longer. It's already public. So what we're asking you to do, would we'll just make it public a little bit faster, um, is, um, is still a bit of a hard sell. I mean, one very simple change we have looked for for our entire four years is to require senators to file their campaign finance reports electronically so we would get them faster and save a quarter million dollars a year. We cannot get this bill through the Senate. Um, I mean, it's ridiculous and outrageous because, of course, they all keep yeah, everything. Like bar napkins or what, what are the... No, no, no. They, it's worse than that, actually. They, they keep their campaign finance reports on their computers, right? So it's digitally available. They print them out. They carry them, the printed records, to the clerk of the Senate, which then ferries them down to the FEC, which then sends them out to be key punished, spending you know $250,000 in six, eight weeks in delay, and then now, then it's made available. And literally, one button, you know, we could have it available immediately. Um, and that's a bipartisan resistance. So on that approach, we, um, we will be asking later this year, we will try a sort of a more positive approach. We're going to say, you know, you can file your reports electronically if you so choose. And so we'll try to line up a half a dozen members who are willing to do that and begin to try to embarrass the others um, into moving it, since we can't move the legislation. 
I know that people since the 80s have been uh, basically putting public data online to kind of force the issue, uh, Carl Malamud and other people. Uh, and so, I mean, I, I think you would probably describe your, part of what you're doing is, is advocacy work by making the data public to show that it's possible, to show that, you know, a small, not that well-funded organization can do it for a fraction of the price that, you know, in the 1990s, a lot of government uh, agencies basically hired subcontractors who would, uh, you know, value add the, the sourcing of public data, you know, for a charge. Um, and so end users ended up having to pay sometimes small funds, but, you know, uh, when you're looking for a lot of data, uh, 25 cents per datum is, is, gets really expensive. So how much do you see this, uh, this process of leveraging? And you said your strategy is changing. What's the next strategy after that kind of prying it open by making stuff public? Well, um, we have, a, it was an, an accidental um, success. Uh, we funded, uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, a website called fedspending.org. It was the first publicly available database on government grants and, and contracts. It was a three-year grant to a nonprofit uh, for $320,000. And it took them six months to get the database up and running. And it was a huge success. About the same time they were building that data site, um, a new piece of legislation was passed, uh, co-sponsored by uh, then-Senator Obama and Senator Coburn, requiring the federal government to create a database nearly identical to the one we had just created. A long and involved story about it eventually passed, and the very first thing that OMB did to get their government-run data, si data site up... No, they didn't scrape it. Okay. They actually... <laughs> purchase the, the, the license for, a, for the software. Um, and so we had two nearly identical databases, um, and we still do have two nearly identical databases. The fascinating piece of the story was that the appropriation to build the government database was $12 million. Ours cost $320,000. Um, so we thought, wow, we have a business model because the nonprofit got $600,000 from the government. And my colleagues in the nonprofit said, it was a nightmare. It easily cost us more than $600,000 in terms of, you know, the pro bono time to negotiate with the government. So I think we, we do feel that we can kind of show them how to do this, um, you know, in some ways. And, but we're very pleased with the administration and the steps forward they're taking, even and though they're no somewhat there's no guarantee that future administrations will be as... Uh, responsive to this. So, that yeah. is right, which is why we're anxious to pass legislation that requires all publicly available information to be online by law, because what the administration do is doing now is only by directive. It could be pulled at, at any moment. It will not be in this administration, um, but it certainly could be by, by future administrations. Oh, Can I, okay. I just yeah. want to add one thing, which is this idea that there's sort of resistance and how do you get government officials to be um, to see the wisdom in, in sharing information. I think it depends on what information you're asking for and also what's your definition of government. If government is just politicians, then yeah, I would agree. But government's made up of, you know, tens of thousands of men and women who work every day and are really proud of the work they do. And so I think we need to think a little more broadly about who what we're asking for and who we're asking it of. Now, in terms of data and spending and all that, absolutely, there are a few people who have their, you know, who have the keys to the, to, the, to the safe there, or the combination to the safe, and getting them to sort of make it readily available is, is, is a real challenge. But um, when you're just talking about information, that, that example I gave about New Hampshire, you know, it did not take any convincing to get town managers around New Hampshire to submit information about their, their budgets um, because they saw it as a public service and they actually appreciated the radio station being willing to help them get the word out but it was the journalists on the other end who actually looked at the information that was being provided and saw a story and then pursued it. So yeah, if you're just going to ask people how, how much money is someone giving your campaign, um, you know, I think there's certain kinds of questions that are going to meet with resistance, but there's a lot of other information and insight and that we could be seeking that we're not. So we're taking a very narrow view of what is government and what information people might want. I think, I mean, we've um, suddenly it's done a couple of things. One is we sometimes identify what we describe as low-hanging fruit. So we, you know, you ask for information, and everybody goes, huh, sure, why not? Sure. Then we had um, one campaign, which I, I don't think actually really worked, although we could claim it was successful. We asked uh, two election cycles ago, we asked members of Congress to post their official calendars online to sign a pledge that if they were elected, they would post their official calendars online. 
we, it, was, it was fascinating. We had 99 challengers sign the pledge. If I'm elected, I will post my calendar online. And zero incumbents uh, signed the pledge. However, um, there must have been something in the water because, you know, at the end of that uh, election campaign, one of those challengers was elected, Kristen Gillibrand. She's now the senator from New York, and she continues to post her calendar online. Uh, which is fascinating, and now there are a handful of others, seven, eight, nine, ten of members of Congress who will do that, and the value in that, I think, is my life, you know, is really an open book. Um, and so, again, we, you know, again, this may be overcoming this cultural resistance that we, we talk about, uh, but it's, um, it's not easy to change, you know, all the history about withholding information. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier um, about um, about the, the difficulties that there are in, in getting um, the public engaged and um, wanting to be active participants. And I was wondering, this is a question for Linda, um, how you go about harnessing participation from the public and um, whether you run into any challenges with um, self-selective um, responses? Sure, I'm, all the responses are self-selected. To, to what we do. So we have to make sure that if we're, if we're seeking information around an issue where, whether it's contentious or not, that we're actively seeking other points of view and not just, I mean, we don't take what we hear from the network and saying, aha, that must be the story because 100 to 1, the responses came in this way versus that way. Um, an example for that would be um, a, a few months ago, we um, sent out a pretty broad-based query to Lutherans in mostly Minnesota, I think, um, and we asked people how the decision by the ELCA to allow actively gay clergy to serve was affecting them, their congregations, and their communities. It was a pretty broad, open-ended question. And um, I don't know, we may have sent it to, I mean, we, we don't ever send one question to 83,000 people. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> that would be a nightmare. Um, so we sent it to maybe, I think, 1,000 people in Minnesota or so, and we got 2,000 responses. So clearly there was a little network effect going on there. And, and we found out later, just by, because you can, you, know, you can find these things out, that uh, the, it, you know, it was kind of passed along with a little bit of a, a push behind it. You know, advocacy, people who want to advocate for a certain position and they want the media to take notice will say, make sure you fill this out and send it. We want them to hear our voice, which is great then we have to take some extra steps and go out and actually find people who have the other point of view. And it's actually a pretty good selling point when you go to an organization and you say, we're hearing a lot of this side, we really want to hear the other side, can you help us get this survey into the hands of some of the people that you represent or some of the people we really want to hear their stories? Um, I think the difference is, is that as a journalist, I often had organizations offer to put me in touch with people. And then I always felt really uncomfortable that they were kind of controlling the message behind the scenes like they'd coach them. In this case, they're just posting a link on a website or sending it out to in a newsletter. And we still get all the raw responses back. Um, so, and the other part of your question was, oh, about engagement um, and, and getting people to, to kind of show up. Well, it's a strange thing. When you ask people for their thoughts, experience, their knowledge on things that they really care about, it doesn't take much more than that. We do beta testing on subject lines, on other things, um, you know, short messages, long messages, long survey forms, short survey forms. We do lots of different, you know, we're always looking at the kind of question that will really spark a great response. We find the question tell us a story that helps illustrate your point of view really works well. People actually will then, and, and we've learned a lot of lessons about yes, no questions often give you yes, no responses. So there's some of that about just getting a certain um, level of response back. But there are times when we will send something out, we think we'll get a great response and we get nothing. Um, and there are times when we're really surprised. Does that answer your question? Or, Sometimes or individuals. I mean, people in the network themselves. We can contact them and say, um, "We see. You know, you've told you, you mentioned that you're um, a member of these organizations, and we're wondering if you'd be willing to sort of, you know, kind of contact them on our behalf." It's often not. Um, well, here's a here's a quick example. So um, when Sarah Palin was uh, the vice presidential nominee, she made a statement that um, if she were in the White House, that um, families with special needs kids would have a friend in the right White House, and that really resonated with a lot of people. And we 
wanted to tap into that and say, wow, these people clearly feel like their stories aren't being heard. Um, so uh, a few months after the election, there was a documentary on special needs families and special needs kids that was going to air in um, a community a few hours away. We didn't have enough advanced time to get someone up to that screening, but we called the filmmaker knowing that they were probably going to stand on a stage and introduce their film. Um, they had 400 people highly engaged on that issue, and we said, hey, would you just be willing to tell them that we want to know more about this issue, and here's the link, and it's on our website. Just get up and tell them. And within a few hours of that screening, we had 80 people respond. 80 out of 100 is a huge response rate. I mean, we usually get 5 to 10 percent um, on an, any given issue, but we're usually sending it to 2,000 people. So that's pretty good. You know, that's, you know, a lot more sources than a journalist usually talks to on a given story. So a question, base curiosity, um, for Ellen. So your work is, is, is on publicly available information. And as we discussed a bit ago, that notion of what's publicly available shifts a little bit, presidential regimes or whatever. Um, and I, I noticed when you were running through your slides, one of the headers was um, information about a dam project was being banned or something. It was, it was a dark spot. Could you just say something about the dark areas um, that currently exist, areas you wish were currently available that aren't? Um, I know the terrorist discourse has been used a lot to block public photography in some municipalities. That's information, but it's apparently secret information. Um, what sort of stuff, what are the odd things you're finding, and what are the areas you think should be addressed that are currently well, dark? Um, we, um, interestingly, um, we do work mostly with publicly available information, but we're starting to say that information is not publicly available unless it's online. Just let's get over the fact, you know, that you know, it's nothing is publicly available if you have to go to a warehouse in Maryland and dig through file cabinets or file a FOIA request, even if it's public information. So that's sort of our starting point. But we actually just funded a joint project with the Center for Public Integrity in Washington, which we're calling the Data Mine Project, to identify useful information that is not classified in any fashion and is not publicly available um, without a, a FOIA request. Um, so what you saw on that website was one of those products, and we were blogging about it twice a week. Um, and, it, I mean, it, you know, you name your agency, there's information that you could imagine would be of use to someone uh, that's just not publicly available. So identifying it really comes from, I mean, the person who's, run, who's doing this project for us over at uh, Center for Public Integrity is a long-time investigative journalist, and, you know, through, you know, through his telephone calls, information gathering for particular stories, he ran into a data set and he said, my God, I never knew that existed. So one of the things that we said very early on to the administration, which they did take to heart, is every agency has to account for, has to do a full audit of the data they collect and how they collect it and how it's made available. Because Nobody knows. I mean, the agencies don't know, right? So this little pocket in this agency may be collecting X, Y, and Z, but nobody knows what they're really collecting, especially if it immediately is, I mean, if it's filed on paper and then filed, you know, in a manila folder and then shipped off to a warehouse in Maryland. So um, our understanding is that as a result of the Open Government Directive on April 6th or 7th, we will have a list of we will have that audit agency by agency of the data that's collected and how it's made available. And then there's supposed to be some priority set for how they move that to being available online, including with public input into that um, on the, uh, the agency's open government um, uh, website pages. So they're asking for public input. Um, it, which is a good thing because the, the very first piece of the directive ordered all the agencies to put uh, three high-value data sets uh, onto data.gov after the first 45 or 60 days, which agencies did. And we looked at these and we said, huh, the wild horse population from the Interior Department uh, is a high-value data set to whom we said, what, what is with that? And then there were some other things that were equally ridiculous. And then we turned around the government and we said, look, guys, the term high-value data set, just do away with it because maybe we're wrong. Maybe wild horse population information is a high-value data set. 
but you've got to justify it. Someone may want to know that, but is it just someone? So inviting the public in to participate and say, okay, here's our laundry list. What do you think is high value? And while, it, again, it's not a statistical uh, sample, you'll get some sense of, you know, anything that deals with perhaps health and safety would be high value, you know, to, a, to an interested citizen. So I think they're beginning to work through this, but it is, it's, it's not an easy process. But it starts with an audit, so we know what's available. I... I was in Phoenix recently and went to a spring training game with my brother, who's a vice president of a local hospital, and I just said, hey, Doug, what kind of information do you have to report to the state? <laughs> do you have to report all adverse incidents? I mean, it's just, he's just telling me, but I think sometimes you can ask people who work in jobs that you think might have to report something to government, and then you have a sense of what government has. So there's, you can, you know, there's sort of the, um, there's that route, but I mean, that's the thing. I mean, we probably have no idea what information is locked away that would be fascinating. And I think it starts by, you know, finding out what do you want to know and who do you want to know it from, and then trying to find those people and, and gather that kind of information. Right. And then, then there, there are clearly categories of um, deliberate, um, not uh, deliberately withholding information. So there's a lot of drug testing information. There's a lot of information out of the FDA over you know, this device or that device that are tested, it's not secret it's not. information. They do not publish it. Um, so we, but we need to know what it is before we can request it. You don't know what you don't know. That's a, that's a great segue to a question that I had, which is um, you, you talk about the, the fact that the data is not uh, provided, and it's, it's data that is on the operations of private institutions, of, of, of pharma companies. or, or uh, uh, and So I guess the question for me is that we're seeing radical shifts in public and private data. You know, there were these um, safeguards put in place with things like social security numbers to say, we want to, uh, you know, prevent uh, uh, corporations from being able to use data about people that are gathered by the government. Um, but in fact, uh, at this point, corporations have far more data about people um, in the private record than, uh, than the government does. So you talked about how uh, politicians are, uh, you know, you want to be able to tell where their bottled water and their flowers are going. MasterCard has that data for me right now, and I'm not in the, in the public domain. So how do you approach um, this question of public and private data? I mean, obviously your mandate is on the public data, um, but increasingly we're seeing real changes in people's lifestyles where, you know, I'm not actually surprised that new politicians are, are better about posting their calendar online because, in fact, that's a choice that, like, 14-year-olds are making nonstop, you know, so you won't actually have to go and photograph them with their mistresses. You, you know, they'll, they'll be posting it on Facebook. So, so the, the, question, the question then is, you know, how, how do you see, as, as the shift between data ownership between private and public has shifted so much, how do you see that relationship, and, and do you think there's any room for an organization that concentrates on that? Well, there is, um, I mean, we, we are certainly well aware of the privacy concerns. Um, you know, private information that may be, um, you know, collected by a corporation. Oh, let's say it was, you know, uh, testing, a, you know, a new device that was implanted in people to do X, and it might have the patient's name there. Um, uh, I don't actually know whether the patient's name on, on whom the device was tested is reported to the FDA. I don't know that, but let's assume for the moment it is, uh, because they may need to track that person in case there's ever a recall or problem or update. Um, obviously, we have to ensure that the privacy information, you know, is redacted from the from the information, and then we have to trust government that what they have redacted is actually appropriate. At the moment, I don't think any of us, um, you know, have that level of trust. I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting story, um, the White House visitor logs. Uh, the administration is doing this voluntarily, and they said, we will post them, but we'll take, I think it's uh, 90 to 120 days to scrub them, because when you go into the White House, you do give them your birth date and your Social Security number and your place of birth. So obviously, they said, we don't want that information. We want to make sure all that gets taken out. And then they said, and then we'll redact or withhold information from, um, for people who are visiting the first family, their, their personal friends, and anyone else where national security might be compromised. Like, whoa. So this is a funny story. Um, so I have a daughter who's doing a graduate class at NYU, and she decides she's going to review the White House visitor logs. 
and I see her post at the end of the assignment, and she says, you know, we have no idea how many people have been redacted. We don't know if it's 100 a month or if it's 500 a month. It's the problem with the electronic document side. It's the problem with the electronic document side. And I thought that was a stunningly good point, which I then raised with the folks at the White House, to which they have not responded yet. <laughs> so, I, I, so I think, the you know, was it's... was redacted. I mean, yeah, there was, <laughs> the response was unspoken or unprintable. So I think, you know, we are all moving into this era, you know, sort of step by step. And, and I think what, you know, we are realizing is it's okay to try something and not have it work. Um, it's okay to have to try something like recovery.gov and get data on the stimulus projects and then realize that some of the garbage is just, some of the data is just garbage, but it raises the issue of what are we doing about data quality? How do we ensure that the numbers are right? And this, this is a remarkable conversation to be having. I don't care whether the data is perfectly clean, but to actually see government saying, how do we do this? How do we do it in a way that's responsible? How do we do it in a way that's trustworthy? How do we do it in a way where the data is, is cleaned and available? Uh, we've never had this discussion um, before, and I think um, it, it really is uh, part of everything that happens in Washington right now. Ellen, um, you set me up really well because I, I just have to know, what do you have on all these people that they seem to listen to you? I mean, is this, is how you seem to really have influence and access in order to, to make not only requests for data, but demands on what should be in that data set. And I'm curious what the Sunlight Foundation and what your leverage is in all of this. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to say it's all us, but I have to say it's a confluence of ideas. We, we have a wonderful chart, which I didn't show you today, of the mentions of the word transparency. Um, for the last 20 years in the New York Times. So uh, one of our data visualizers did this great chart and I asked him last night to double check the numbers. When Sunlight started in 2006, I think the number was something like 410 mentions of the word transparency in the New York Times and last year it was nearly double that. I'd like, of course, to take full credit for that. I can't. It is, I, I think I said this earlier, it is a, a cultural uh, shift that's happening. Um, you know, uh, we expect stuff in real time. I want to know what the weather is. I want to, you know, contact um, my other daughter. I do it by text messaging. I, you know, it, it's government is is playing catch up. I think to where the rest of us have moved in terms of, you know, real time information and how we live our lives online. So I'd like to say that Sunlight's fully responsible for it, but um, but we're not. I guess, I mean, kind of follow up on, on that too. I'm just, I'm curious whether you have, like, who are the advocates within government that are communicating most with you and most receptive to your mission? Um, politicians, but also within the different departments. Um, are there particular departments that you're speaking with more? And then related to that also, we were talking about who controls information, what gets released. Um, how much in the designing of your, of your, um, you know, your, your transparency kind of platforms are you also thinking about uh, getting information that's not um, publicly available, but that uh, could be made publicly available to people within the government who want to leak information, whistleblowers or, or other people? Um, well, there's a large community of nonprofits in Washington who have been in, um, I would say, the, the public information space. Uh, there's actually a coalition called the Open the Government Coalition. Uh, and I believe it has something like 50 or 70 members, uh, different uh, nonprofits who have joined it. Um, it's it's a uh, you know it's a, it's it is a coalition. It has fought in the past mostly on FOIA related issues. Um, within that, there are probably five or six major organizations uh, who are are part of the constant um, you know uh, discussions, arguments, lobbying that goes on both on Capitol Hill and in the White House. What the administration did, which was rather remarkable, is they appointed a, a federal CIO. Um, who was the former DC CTO, a man by the name of Vivek Kundra, uh, who understands this space and understands, seems to understand the, the politics of how you, you move people who are not 
you know, like the people who report to him, into this space to understand why this is important for delivering services, why it's important for economic development, why it's important for democracy. And so he has been a terrific leader alongside the federal CTO, which is a brand new position, uh, which is headed by Anish Chopra, who likewise really understands this space. And so they, um, along with the White House Ethics Council, Norm Eisen, uh, and the head of the regulatory section of OMB, Cass Sunstein, have formed a, a kind of very close group which have been driving these White House-based initiatives. And that's, that's tremendous. It makes all the difference in the world. On the Hill, the allies come uh, from across, um, you know, across the spectrum. Uh, one of the early users of social media is one of the most conservative congressmen from Texas. His name is John Culberson. And, you know, you know, direct tweeting me, you know, at 7.30 in the morning, um, quick, uh, you know, uh, quick viewing, or whatever it's called, you know, all of his meetings, his conferences, and, and he gets a lot of attention for it, uh, and he gets a lot of kudos for it, and so other people look over their shoulder and they go, wow, maybe I should do that. You know, to Nancy Pelosi, who has a very active blog, who really understands the space and has been inst very instrumental in some of the big successes we've had, like getting the White House um, expenditure reports online. So there are a lot of allies, both in the House and the Senate. The um, uh, Transparency Caucus that's about to be introduced, one of the most conservative members, um, uh, Isa from California, one of the uh, most recent freshman members, Quigley, Democrat from Illinois, that's actually Rahm Emanuel's seat. I mean, you just like, you see these strange bedfellow things happening all the time. So it's, uh, it's finding people who want to be leaders in this space. We find um, a lot of Republicans calling for a lot of transparency now that they're out of power. Um, and, uh, but there are plenty of Democrats, you know, who call for it as well. So we, we, we try to walk this fine line between both of them uh, to get something that, that really does make sense. I have a question. How how do you deal or how do they deal with transparency when so much of what uh, Congress has has always been protected from FOIA, so some of their own records and things like that? So I'm wondering, do we, are we going to see a, a big change in that? Um, well, uh, we have said that uh, FOIA for Congress is, uh, you know, is certainly in our, um, certainly in our sights. I think it will be a long time coming, actually. So they, Congress is more resistant to this trend uh, than the administration has been. There is absolutely no question about it. So that's why we want to try some of the more positive things and making sure that members who use social media, who do communicate directly, uh, get the rules committee to change uh, the rules about um, you know, how they can use social media. So we launched until a year or so ago, maybe 18 months or so ago, members of Congress were actually forbidden from using social media on their websites. So we launched a Let Our Congress Tweet campaign. <laughs> I don't know, coincidence or not, they were already thinking about changing the rules, but two weeks later they changed the rules so members can actually tweet from the House floor. Uh, and use video and have, you know, interactive sections of their websites. So it's, you know, it's just pushing open the door, you know, a little bit at a time. I find it really interesting, not only the CTO positions that you talked about, uh, but also in state, uh, uh, Alec Ross. I mean, you're really seeing, because Silicon Valley uh, seemed to contribute quite a bit to the Obama campaign, there are a bunch of people at all kind of levels of the federal government now who represent the concerns of Google and other organizations like that. And, of course, every... Every time you get someone from industry who takes a turn in government, they create a government that's going to be a little bit better for them. And so I find this really kind of an interesting side effect. Of it is, it is fascinating um, to, I mean, the State Department uh, under uh, Alec Ross's um, leadership is, has been terrific, and they're doing really amazing stuff. Um, and so, you know, we can the find results out. are in yet, but, but they're no, trying we, really they're amazing trying. things. Yeah, they're yeah, trying. Yeah. And I think the fact that government is being allowed, that people inside government are allowed to become experimental the same way that we on the outside just like, well, try that, didn't work. Or we tried that and wow, what a success. That's, that represents pretty much of a, a major transformation in the way that button-down government usually works. And certainly states. I mean, there are a number of states out there, I think, who with 
without pressure from organizations like Sunlight or anyone else are just sort of doing some of this on their own. Now, they may not be doing it quite to this extent, but I know when I was in Utah, you know, all campaign contributions are electronic. They're searchable. Um, you can follow legislation. You can sign up for email um, alerts every time a bill is amended. So there, you know, I think it would be wrong that the assumption that is all that all government wants to keep all government information secret, but there's certainly, you know, there's enough resistance out there to, to make us cautious. But yeah. And enough cities now have made, like D.C. has made their information available, uh, San Francisco has made their information available. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I know that there are at least another half a dozen cities that are moving in the same direction following D.C. and San Francisco so that citizens can have access to information that they want, whether it's information on bus stops or city parks that need repair or, you know, what, whatever that, in, all information is Did local. we answer your question on whistleblowing, though? Yeah, just, that, was my, that was the second question, was just on leaks and whistleblowing. To what extent are you, are you thinking about strengthening the role of um, internal, you know, agents of... Yeah, sunlight um, doesn't really deal in the whistleblowing, um, you know, the sort of that 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 uh, method for reporting information. But one of our close colleague organization does. Uh, the Project on Government Oversight has a, a series of recommendations with respect to whistleblower protections to protect them. Uh, they also deal in the area of government contracting and oversight uh, in that arena as well. So I'm going to have to um, call an end to this, but I just want to mention that um, we have a reception upstairs at the R&D Cafe, uh, and uh, assuming that some of you have kids to get home to, I think we have enough uh, drinks for everyone. Um, so so please come up to the um, please come upstairs. Um, I also wanted to mention. I mean, I, if there had been more time, I actually would have asked. Um, uh, you both about uh, taking these models that are working really well in the United States internationally, and um, the State Department seemed like a good segue, but we don't have time for that. But so the, the segue that I'll make is that April 15th, we have a, another uh, communications forum. Uh, this will be hosted by Ethan Zuckerman. If you don't know him, he runs Global Voices, or uh, was involved in the founding of Global Voices. Uh, start, he founded Geek Corps, um, uh, the kind of uh, uh, Peace Corps for, for geeks. Um, and uh, is, is really tied into a lot of these questions about transparency, accountability, citizen journalism internationally. And so that session is going to be quite different. He's basically going to be bringing in by Skype uh, people from around the world uh, for like five or ten minute sections. Uh, people are involved in uh, the Twitter revolution in Moldova or uh, in Iran. Uh, people are involved in uh, developing Ushahidi in Kenya. So it's going to be kind of a, a, a low res um, everyone's going to sound like robots, but, um, but uh, uh, very, very wide cast uh, question about civic media in different places, April 15th, same time, same place. Uh, so thank you so much for coming out, and come on up and have a drink with us.